Our next speaker, Ms. Elizabeth Parrish, is a humanitarian, entrepreneur, and innovator, is a leading voice for genetic cures. She is actively involved in international education media outreach and sits on the board of the International Longevity Alliance. She is the CEO of BioViva, a company that went um, that wants to bring new technology to the world that will change the paradigm of aging forever through the power of gene therapy. Elizabeth Parrish is also known as the woman who wants to genetically engineer you. Welcome, Elizabeth Parrish. So why would I want to genetically engineer you? What's wrong with you? <laughs> There's nothing wrong with you in a sense. I like who you are. I like how you think. I like that you're here. You're obviously on the cutting edge of what's going on. The most important thing is you and keeping you alive. I want to genetically engineer you because I want to make you stronger, faster, more visually accurate, and I want to reverse your aging. That's a pretty big task. My company is BioViva. We're the first two clinic gene therapy company that I know of, that I've heard of, and we've looked long and hard. And we want to reverse biological aging. So why would we want to do that? Let's talk about that. First of all, why would we want to genetically engineer you? So you wouldn't want to run your new phone or your new computer on an old operating system. We don't want you running on an old operating system. We find that when we ask people about whether they would like to do this or not, we get three categories, and it's much like upgrading your operating system. We get the show me details group. These are people who want to learn more about what's going on. They want to know what exactly are you going to do to me. We've got the no, not now group. No, I don't think so. I think I'll wait till later. And then we've got the group that's the continue. And this is two groups of people. It's a very small group of excited people who are ready to pioneer their future, who are actually relatively healthy. But mostly it's compassionate care. It's people who have no option and they're dying now. So every day, I want you to put this into perspective, we lose 100,000 people to dying of aging diseases. These are all people who could come forward and be test subjects. We should be making the big push to find out what happens when we, we manipulate the genome. And we've got pretty good ideas on how to do that already. So why would we treat aging as a disease? That's a pretty big statement for a company. I would tell you that cellular degeneration underlies biological aging and is the master disease. And as a matter of fact, all of these ugly names you see on here, the big killers, are just symptoms of aging cells. This is why your mortality increases as you get older. This is why your risk of death goes up exponentially after the age of 65. So these are the symptoms of aging cells. Biological aging is what is killing us. And so far, we haven't been able to do much but slow that down, called the amelioration of disease. So what's normal? When I go and I first start this talk with a lot of people, they'll say, but it's normal to die of aging. This is absolutely normal. Why would we want to die any other way? This is, this is how we do it. <laughs> But I'll tell you that it's not normal, and we're going to go back and we're going to look at a graph uh, from uh, 1665. It's the graph on the left, obviously. And the normal way for humans to die is before the age of 35 of infectious disease. This is actually how we die. Most of us would already be dead, uh, sad but true. Only 1% of the population at that time died of aging. These are from death records in London. The plague was rampant at this time, but if you fast forward 100 years, we see the same data, okay? When we look at the, the chart on the right, this is how we die now. We've gotten infectious disease down to 3%. We're going to talk about why we did that and how we did that. Uh, but the rest of the graph now is filled with aging diseases, OK? We know that childhood mortality actually happens, but it doesn't really even make the graph. So if we split this room into three, this is very disconcerting. Uh, we can pretty much tell you how you're going to die. One third will die of heart disease, one third will die of cancer, and the other third will be lucky enough of, to die of things like kidney failure and accidents, dementia, and frailty. So what is science going to do? We're not going to stop here. We're going to change this graph, right? I mean, our lives depend on it. 
So these are uh, four different uh, times in our history. Uh, the bottom line is 1850, and then we go to 1925, 1975, and 2010. And what we're looking here is at the, the different ways that we've died over different years, okay? If we look at this right here, we'll see in 1850, over 25% of the population was dead by the age of 10. That's a lot. And actually, the population here goes on to be not very robust, okay? So when we're really sick in childhood, it sets us up for a not very robust, healthy life. And now we know that. What's the difference here? It's antibiotics and immunizations. They changed everything. It was the first preventative and regenerative medicine. Just completely changed it. We're living so long, we're living so well. Okay, let's go here. So if we look at this here, we're gonna go up, we're gonna look at this little uh, blue uh, arrow because we went forward. This here, a lot of people ask us what this is. This is actually increase of health span from six to 12 years. People will guess and they'll say, well, it must be exercise, it must be Pilates, it must be nutrition, something we're doing. This here is actually just the cessation of smoking cigarettes. <laughs> so what Bill told you is true. If you don't want to expedite your death, uh, you certainly want to take some bad habits away. So we added some good habits, we took some bad habits away, but we still have the bottleneck. It's the bottleneck we'd like to break, and we'd actually like to make that line across the top flat instead of having a death curve. Okay, so right in here is where about we'd want to set your cells. This is what we want them to behave like. There's no therapy on the planet that will be like Benjamin Button. You won't turn into a young person, but if we can get your cells to behave like this area that this red circle is around, uh, we believe that, in fact, you won't die of these diseases that you see mm, farther on down the graph. And you see when these diseases happen, they're not happening in young people. We're accumulating that problem, but we're not suffering from it yet. So how do we treat biological aging as a disease? And what would we do about it? So we want to lengthen your telomeres. We want to reverse atherosclerotic plaques. Remember, heart disease kills a third of you. We want to clear misfolded proteins. This is junk that we build up when our cells aren't doing house cleaning very well anymore, like when we were young. We want to remove senescent cells. Senescent cells are nasty old cells, and they can't divide anymore. And so they send out proteins to other cells and really upset them and, and, and cause inflammation and turmoil. We want to strengthen your muscles, because I want you to be better than before. We want to boost your immune system, because right in here might lie the cure for cancer. And we want to increase your cell signaling. So we want your cells to talk well to one another. So why would we treat biological aging? I mean, besides the fact that we all want to live young and robustly. This graph here might give you some indication. So I'm going to tell you something very, very powerful. So when people ask you about overpopulation, I want you to remember this. As lifespan increases, fertility rates go down. And it doesn't matter what religion, it doesn't matter what corner of the world, it doesn't matter that your culture will ever meet their culture and combine. As lifespan increases, fertility rates go down, it's proven. And as a matter of fact, in 2020, we're gonna have more people on the earth over 65 than under five years of age. Yeah, and those under five years of age go on to be your workforce the people that pay for the medicine that you need to take once you've retired. I want to take all of these people over 65, and I want to give them uh, the ability to go back to work, to help sustain themselves, instead of these young people who, at one point, there will be one to every 100 persons over 65 standing over their head. It's projected by 2040, 35% of the GDP will be spent on health care. That means goodbye clean water and public education. We can't afford it. 
So treatments today, what does that look like? So on the far left here, we see infectious disease. People still die of infectious disease. We saw that. It's a smaller number. We hear about it. It actually makes headlines. It wouldn't have made headlines uh, in 1665. You're going along, you get an infectious disease, and boom, you're dead. In the middle, the middle graph, we see amelioration of disease. We see what pharmaceuticals have offered us. We're going along, we have a problem, we have maybe a heart problem, we take a drug, we never really come back to optimal health, but we come up a bit and then the next problem hits us and we take another drug and we never quite come up back to optimal health. But it definitely uh, expands our lifespan. We were living longer because of it. And if we zoom out from the middle graph and look at the right graph, this is what the slow fade to death looks like. With gene therapy, we want to take you across the top. And as a matter of fact, we're not really sure then what you'll die of. If you're healthy, what do you die of? Not healthy for 85, not healthy for 45. A lot of people will say, you know, my doctor said I'm healthy for my age. But the visual signs of aging that you see on the outside are happening inside of us all. I don't have this image in this graph and I, uh, in this presentation, but I wish that I did. I actually have images of an 80-year-old's brain, and you can see the atrophy in it. And actually, it's a person without dementia. This is happening throughout us, and we want to think of it um, as that. It's very important. So how does gene therapy work? People are pretty excited about this because it's a very actually non-invasive process. Your cells think it's pretty invasive, but actually it's just a series of injections. So what we do is we find the gene that's our target gene, the gene that makes you smarter, faster, stronger, more visually accurate. We take that gene and we put it into a vector. In this case, our company uses AAV. It's a virus. We take out its ability to replicate and we put the gene of interest in, okay? So it can't go on to make you sick. And as a matter of fact, AAV doesn't make humans sick. It infects moths, not humans. And so our bodies don't even recognize it as being a problem. Then it goes into the body, it delivers the gene. And what genes do is they make proteins and those proteins make you. Okay, that's, it's, it's so lovely and simple and sweet, okay? So all of your cells, your cell walls, what you look like, your hair, all of this is your genes expressing. That's evolution. So if we add a gene and it makes a new protein, what happens? It changes you. I don't really like animal um, testing. I'm all for getting human data. We've proven that one and n equals one human data is more powerful than 8,000 mice. But it, the great thing about mice is they don't live very long, okay? And so we can actually get data from mice that it would take a really long time to get from humans. We're gonna look at a field mouse here. This field mouse lives for eight months in the wild, okay? And what happens is it gets predated. It gets a little slower in its thinking, it doesn't realize, and it gets eaten. That's the, the main cause of their death. If you take the same mouse and you put it in a laboratory, you take away predation, you give it all the food that it wants to eat, it doubles its lifespan. Just by taking that away, it's living a comfy, cozy life and doing all the things it wants to do. That's pretty fantastic. So take your stress away and you double your lifespan. Here's calorie restriction in optimal exercise, okay? The mouse on your left is the same age as the mouse on the right. This mouse has been extended massively in its lifespan by just adding exercise and diet a very restricted diet where it gets all the nutrition it needs but nothing extra because we know obesity ex expedites uh, death, okay? This is pretty amazing. But what happens when you change just one gene? You double the lifespan. This mouse is living for 60 months. It has the addition of a gene that actually we humans could upregulate ourselves and it doesn't have to worry about its diet or exercise. <laughs> so 
this is where mice really pay off for us. <laughs> Everyone goes, wow, cool, yeah, I want some of that, me too. Okay, <laughs> so what is experimental medicine? So this, this rat is saying, I go home today, they cured me using this new miracle drug. I'm afraid it'll be years before it's approved for humans. <laughs> And we see this, we see this in the news all the time. You know, cancer's been cured, this has been cured, that's been cured, we got a cure for Alzheimer's. Bring me the proof, because our company will use it. Well, we have looked at the research, we have scoured the research, and we see all sorts of promise. When people come to us and they say that's experimental medicine, I say to them, the FDA has passed a bunch of experimental medicine and you're guaranteed to die taking it. So what risk do you want to take? You take your statins, you'll die of heart disease anyway. You take your other medicines, you're almost guaranteed to die of whatever you've been diagnosed with. So I would say that it's all an experiment and theirs is failing and it's time for a new one. So what are we doing? This is where it gets exciting. What are our therapies? So number one, uh, and the diseases we're chasing is number one, Alzheimer's, okay? We just saw in Bill Andrews' presentation how mice regrew their brains, how they went from states of dementia to fully functioning mice, okay? Alzheimer's is a devastating disease. I'll bet everyone in this room or nearly everyone in this room knows someone who has had it. We believe that this is the great disease to bring telomerase induction to with a therapy that's 3,000 times stronger than any nutraceutical on the market. And as a matter of fact, this same gene therapy has reversed aging in mice, as he showed. We want to bring it to humans. We want to see what happens in this very devastating disease of Alzheimer's for compassionate care. What a great test subject we might reverse their disease and their aging. The next uh, treatment that we have is for sarcopenia. We're already using this one. This one is in phase three clinical trials with muscular dystrophy at, ch at Nationwide Children's Hospital. It's safe enough to use in children. We think that it would be safe enough to use in people over 65. For sarcopenia, we saw on the graph, frailty kills 6% of the population. Okay, here is one of our subjects. On your left, you'll see his legs before. These are not stakes. <laughs> this is actually an MRI of, of his legs. This was before treatment, and on the right, we see after treatment. We see, and this is actually only five months after treatment. The, the, the therapy peaks out at eight to 12 months. Okay, you'll see an increase in muscle mass. You'll see a decrease in fat. This increases insulin sensitivity, and it actually upregulates FOXO3, a gene that we think is directly responsible to longevity. In uh, hamster studies that were done, the hamsters lived 40% longer than the control group. It's very exciting. The patient here who took uh, these MRI images uh, started having such good health benefits four years out that he took a CT angiogram and had zero atherosclerotic plaques. We don't know. We're going to track that data. Okay, that could be a cure for a third killer of the population. We just don't know. Oh, actually, I should step back. I want to tell you really quick some really big news, and you won't want to forget this because it's starting to make uh, headlines. This last therapy right here for Alzheimer's disease, the telomerase induction, and this therapy right here for sarcopenia, We've just treated our first subject to try to reverse biological aging. So we made history. Not only did we use telomerase induction in a human body, uh, which had never been done with this type of gene therapy, but we used two gene therapies because that we know that aging probably doesn't have just one angle. And we're going to see what happens. And over the next 12 months, we're hoping that we will see the reversing of aging for the first time in the world. <laughs> My company is very fast and we're very small. It took me two years to find the people that would do this. 
ALS and Parkinson's disease, I know that I've heard people have questions about this. We have a patent that we're hoping to get um, very soon for a gene therapy that has to do with stem cell work that one of our doctors did. He did stem cell work, intrathecal injections of stem cells to the brains of ALS patients. And he saw these miraculous, um, thank you, he saw these miraculous um, effects. He saw people talking that hadn't talked. He saw people standing up who hadn't walked. But then they would regress back into the disease. He started to tra track what was happening with some of his patients and why some of them weren't having benefits. And he believes that, in fact, that it's H factor. This is something that stem cells emit. Most of the stem cells leave the area, and after they leave the area, they're still signaling for a while, and then it goes down. H factor is actually turned on in all of your body except for your brain. So for these patients, this is maybe a potential cure. So we're actually applying for a grant uh, from the Michael J. Fox Foundation to see if we can take this through more testing, and we're really excited about this, okay? So smarter, stronger, healthier humans. That's what I want for you. That's what I want for everyone. We've treated patients with monogenic disease um, in the past. So we treated a boy with adrenal leukodystrophy, and he is doing incredibly well now. A monogenic disease means that there's one gene that's the problem, okay? So if you think about there's a symphony in your, each one of your cells, there's one player that's not playing very well. Well, we put a good player in, okay? And that often cures the problem. We're, be, we're building gene therapies to treat aging as a disease, and that is our hallmark, because we believe that this is where real cures will come from, not from treating symptoms. We've spent trillions of dollars on, on treating symptoms. As a matter of fact, if we're successful, the U.S. government will save $1 trillion a year. So whoever gets the presidency, <laughs> they want to save $4 trillion in their presidential term, uh, we'd like them to come talk to us. So we'll become leaders in genomic engineering. So when we think about the symphony, what we do now is we put in a good player. With genomic engineering, this is a, the future of where gene therapy will be going, we'll actually look at why that, that player isn't playing very well. And it might be a myriad of genes. It, it might be you know, three or four different things uh, that we need to change out. And we'll be able to cut and edit in the future as well. So the future of genetic cures, where are we going? We want these given like immunizations. We want to blur the line between enhancement and preventative medicine. We know we can make you stronger and more youthful and better and healthier. But where do we start doing that? So right now we need to work with an aging population and we need to reverse your biological aging so we don't have the detriment of disease and suffering that comes from it. But in the future we think that these will be given younger and younger. They'll keep you from getting sick to begin with. The future consequences of this type of therapy are organ regeneration, maybe directly right in your body without transplantation. Immune system, that is a big target if we want to cure cancer. Radiation resilience, NASA con contacted me. We had a really nice call seeing if we had anything that would keep astronauts from being affected by radiation. This has a lot to do with our future and expanding into the solar system. Better vision. If we can broaden the spectrum that you can see, wouldn't that be fun? Cosmetic. A lot of people think of cosmetics when they come to us. They say, can you make my skin younger? I say, if your skin doesn't look younger, then we've failed because that's a sign of aging. Intelligence. There are genes being tracked down for intelligence now. We've got our eye on one. Physical enhancement. We can already make you stronger. So we have the gene therapy that will increase your muscle mass by about 20%. Um, but there will be other enhancements in the future. They, they're looking at things for strength. You know, muscle mass doesn't mean strength. There's genes for strength. There's also genes for speed. Nutritional, you know, you have the gene for vitamin C in your cells, but it turned off. We could probably turn that back on. You're making your own antioxidants then. And this actually has use for NASA as well. So when people go up in spaceships, the more uh, nutrients that you can make on your own, the better. Autoimmune disorders, we'd like to stop things like diabetes type 1 and uh, Crohn's disease. 
arthritis, stop them before they happen, and congenital disease, of course. We don't want to forget children. I actually got into this to uh, find cures for children, and I ended up on the uh, complete opposite end of the spectrum. But by doing that, we can bring cures uh, back to children. So, as in summary, because we have limited amount of time, we want to change the paradigm of what we consider normal, and that starts with you. Telling people that actually dying of aging isn't normal. If you want to talk about normal, we used to die of infectious disease, we need to move science forward so that we hopefully don't even know what we'll die of. The symptoms of aging are cancers, Alzheimer's, heart disease, kidney failure. All of these things are symptoms of aging cells. This is why we've spent so much money and we can't cure them. We're learning to change and reverse aging. This isn't science fiction anymore, it's science fact. We've done it. We've done it in every human tissue. We need to do it in the human body. We're working on therapies now and we're doing them. Gene therapy, much like immunizations and antibiotics, offers regenerative and preventative medicine in one. So it's very powerful. And the new therapies will more than pay for themselves once we get the costs down. I want to thank my scientific advisory board. If you'll notice here, Bill Andrews is in the top left. And um, I want to say something about these people. Everyone who stepped forward to be on our scientific advisory board are the most forward-thinking scientists in the world. It's a big risk to come up to behind, be behind a company like ours one that's moving so fast, okay? I also want to thank George Church, um, who's down in the middle. He's a very um, fantastic person. He's been great to us. He uh, sequenced the first human genome in 2003 and has gone on to create eight different companies that are working on various uh, areas of the human genome. And then in the top right, just as important, is George Martin. He heads the um, Alzheimer's research at the University of Washington and the research on progeric children that you saw Bill share a slide on. We'd really like to cure those kids. Um, thank you so much, and please visit us at BioVivaSciences.com. Thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> thank you, Elizabeth.